After the invasion of Normandy in June of 1944 and the Allied push into mainland Europe, it was necessary to capture more German-occupied facilities to unload the supplies required for the advancing troops. The military then set their eyes on the port of Brest in northwestern France. The Americans initially believed that capturing the port would not be that difficult, but Brest was occupied by the battle-tested 2nd Falschermjäger Division, led by one of the most renowned German generals, Hermann Bernard Rumke. The German paratroopers were surrounded, outnumbered, and outpowered, but they would resist for over a month against all odds. Invading Ports After the fall of France in 1940, the United States and the United Kingdom began planning a possible reconquest of Western Europe if the U.S. decided to join the war effort. The plans began to take form with Operation Overlord and Operation Neptune, which resulted in the largest seaborne operation in history with the Allied invasion of Normandy in June of 1944. However, one of the crucial aspects of these operations was the logistics behind supplying the invading forces. Tens of thousands of tons of war materials that ranged from armament to food would be required to keep the momentum of the Allied forces going. Thus, it was deemed essential to capture as many enemy ports as possible on the Atlantic coast to establish a steady supply chain line for friendly forces fighting at the front. When the Wehrmacht found out about the Allied intentions, they began fortifying French port cities as part of the Atlantic Wall envisioned by Hitler. Some of these cities were Saint-Malo, Saint-Nazaire, Lorient, and Brest in the Brittany Peninsula. Others were in Normandy, such as Cherbourg, Le Havre, and Dieppe. Out of them, the port of Brest was the most cherished, as it was the westernmost port in France and the most significant harbor of the French fleet. More importantly, Brest had an impressive U-boat base that housed several bomb-proof concrete submarine pens that were almost impregnable to Allied bombs. The Royal Air Force had been trying to destroy it since 1941 with little success. Kriegsmarine vessels like the sister ships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau had been refueled and repaired in Brest, and U-boats usually sought shelter at the port after long months of patrolling overseas. Soon after the Allies landed at Utah, Omaha, and other sectors of Normandy, several ports began falling under their control. As part of Operation Cobra, the Germans were swiftly surrounded by General George C. Patton's Third Army in the Brittany Peninsula before making a final push for Paris. But the Germans did not surrender. The Führer ordered the remaining Wehrmacht troops to regroup and stay put at Festung Brest, or Fortress Brest, a term used to indicate a late war German doctrine to fortify a surrounding city and resist until the last bullet is fired. To lead this last stand, the Führer chose one of the Reich's most prominent generals, Hermann Bernard Ramke, simply known to his men as Papa Ramke. A German defense. Ramke was a World War I veteran and a battle-tested warrior of the Crete and Africa Corps campaigns. He also fought under General Erwin Rommel as the leader of a parachute brigade of Fallschirmjägers that were used as elite infantry. Rumke's brigade once pulled one of the most incredible escapes of the war when they captured a British supply column to evade the encirclement of Allied forces as the Germans retreated from the African theater. For his actions, Rumke was awarded the Oak Leaves of the Knight's Cross by Hitler and promoted to command the 2nd Fallschirmjäger Division. To defend Brest, Ramke had his reliable 2nd Division under his command and remnants of the 266th and 343rd Infantry Divisions of the Heer. The forces amounted to about 42,000 men in total, and the idea was for the paratroopers to boost the garrison's morale during the siege through their discipline, training, and tenacity. The Germans had plenty of ammunition to share, as well as dozens of MG-34 and MG-42 machine guns that were strategically placed in pillboxes. All the men were split in a formidable network of bunkers, pillboxes, and trenches, arranged in a cunning way to force the attackers to close quarters combat in the city, where numbers were not always an advantage. The emplacements were accommodated in exterior and interior lines that would force the Americans for house-to-house -house combat. Their objective was to inflict the maximum number of enemy casualties while diminishing the loss of friendlies. To ensure that the German garrison could accomplish its mission, Ramke evacuated the civilians to avoid collateral damage from both armies. However, many people decided to stay in the city, especially French resistance fighters. Fort Montbourret, an 18th century fort located west of the city, was the defenders' most vital sector. The fort's thick masonry walls were coupled with a 40-foot embankment and a 40-foot wide and 15-foot deep moat. And its outer walls and pillboxes were also protected by a line of buried naval shells with trigger igniters to terminate any American tanks. The Germans were ready to defend the city at all costs. The Battle
breast was encircled on August 7, 1944, by the 8th Corps of the U.S. Army under Lieutenant General Troy H. Middleton, which exceeded 73,000 well-equipped soldiers with plenty of artillery support and tank battalions. Following typical American doctrine, the U.S. forces bombed the city before attacking, but the effort was futile. Artillery strikes, bombs, and napalm had little effect on the Germans. Ramke and his men were committed to defending the city, and the Jaegers counterattacked with all their might. By August 29th, Sergeant McBee's platoon's position in the inner city was overrun by the Germans. After emptying his ammunition, the sergeant charged at the enemy with his knife and got one of them before being shot down. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for these actions, which gave his unit time to regroup and hold off the German advance. Heavy casualties eventually forced Middleton to shift his large-scale assaults for minor attack and hold operations. The American GI suddenly found themselves using satchel charges and flamethrowers like their marine compatriots to lure out entrenched German paratroopers and grenadiers from houses. And the fights soon became reminiscent of the brutal combat at the Pacific Theater against the Japanese. Meanwhile, extreme rain and fog turned the Allied advance slower and limited the use of artillery and aircraft bombing. General Dwight D. Eisenhower then authorized Middleton to, quote, utilize a maximum number of aircraft which can be effectively employed in support of this operation. Days later, Rumke notified General Middleton that more civilians were being evacuated to a sector in the city's outskirts, where German medical personnel attended wounded soldiers and civilians. A brief ceasefire was granted to transport wounded men from both sides. However, a small German vessel functioning as a field hospital marked with the colors of the International Red Cross was blown up by Allied forces, and the artillery helped the Americans reach the outer lines of the Fallschirmjägers. But the attack was quickly brought to a halt by the accurate machine gun fire of the German pillboxes. Major Tom Dallas, commander of the 1st Battalion, and British soldiers from the 141st Regiment Royal Armored Corps then used their 15 flamethrowing crocodile tanks to clear pillboxes and houses. The odd-looking tanks were part of a tank force nicknamed Hobart's Funnies in honor of armored expert Percy Hobart. Instead of a machine gun, the crocodiles were equipped with flamethrowers that could project flammable fuel as far as 120 yards. Some of the tanks were caught by the hidden naval shells, but others cleared the way. According to the unit's post-war history, they left behind a, quote, burning track of death through the rich harvest of machine guns and light anti-aircraft and anti-tank guns. Artillery began pounding Fort Montbray to clear a path to the American infantry. The effects were devastating, and Ramke negotiated another brief ceasefire with Middleton to evacuate civilians that had sought shelter on the German defenses. Ammunition started to run short, as well as food and medical supplies. And to make matters worse for the Germans, the Americans began using tear gas to lure them out. Although a German vessel that escaped the Allied blockade managed to deliver some supplies in the middle of the night, the situation soon turned desperate. But the Fallschirmjägers stood firm and faithful to Rumke, and the Germans managed to hold on for a few more days until the general decided to finally surrender. Aftermath The defenders opted to destroy the port facilities, rendering them useless before surrendering to the Americans. Ramke then fired the last artillery shell and resigned on September 19th. Brigadier General Charles Canham arrived to accept the surrender. As he approached Ramke, the general asked Canham to show him his credentials. Canham, a lower-ranking officer, grinned, pointed towards his troops, and said, quote, These are my credentials. General Ramke was captured and remained in prison for over six years in different locations at the United States, England, and France, while his expedient was studied and assessed. However, Middleton, and other American soldiers that fought in Brest never testified against him. Instead, they shared their admiration for fulfilling his duties as a soldier. As for the port of Brest, no Allied vessel ever docked in it. Thank you for watching my video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below what you think of the conduct displayed by both generals during the fierce Battle of Brest.